I, um, I work at the City University of New York. I, I'm a researcher, uh, not a professor at CUNY anyway. And I work at a research center called the Center for Urban Research. We do a lot of analysis of demographic patterns, neighborhood change. Um, we're really interested in voting patterns because information about voting to us really is two things. One, it's, uh, it's a, a reflection of the changing city, the changing population throughout the city, citywide and very local. And it's also a reflection of um, who has power in the city, uh, who can participate in the civic conversation, and who elected officials listen to and who they don't, and, and how that changes uh, what the local patterns are. So it's, it's very important for everyone in terms of voting and participation, and it's fascinating for us as demographers and, and researchers. Um, so what I wanted to do was go through a number of maps that we made for the 2013 mayoral race, we developed an election atlas for New York City, where we created maps of voting patterns for a lot of the candidates for mayor, going back to 2001, and we've continued to update that uh, with the more recent gubernatorial election and presidential election that we're in now. Um, so I'll show some of those maps and hopefully give you a, a flavor of some of the research that we've been doing. There's a lot to go through, so hopefully I can cover it all and maybe touch on some points later. So the, the first thing to think about is, well, who's enrolled to, who's registered to vote, can vote? Um, a little later on, I'll talk about who is eligible to even register, which is an important consideration as well. But, so New York is a democratic town. Uh, registered Democrats are everywhere. You can see the yellow outline on the map is Senator Sanders' district that we're in now, District 10 the state senate and um, registration patterns and voting patterns also tend to follow but don't always follow uh, predominant race and ethnicity patterns using the categories from the u.s census bureau of uh, race and ethnicity characteristics and it's not a complete accurate reflection of the population there are a lot of ways to understand who is where uh, but that, that's one of the most common ones that, that demographers use. And so I'll go through some of those. So you can see where the big concentrations of Democratic uh, enrollment is and where it's not. And actually, the next slide is almost a mirror image of that, where registered Republicans are. Um, it's interesting that there are registered Republicans all over the city. Most of the concentration of them, though, is you can see in Staten Island, um, southern Brooklyn, parts of Queens, not southeast Queens where we are right now. Uh, not upper Manhattan or, or much of the Bronx, but to some extent, and I'll show you a map if I have time later, who voted for Donald Trump in the primary. So you can see how, that, how closely that follows that map. And this is um, kind of a, a way of coming back to as a reference point, again, predominant race and ethnicity characteristics throughout the city. Um, this is by census tract, which is an area of like 2,500 people or so. And um, we live in a very mixed city, uh, especially in Queens, which people consider the, you know, the, the, really the melting pot of the city. But nonetheless, the population kind of follows pretty uh, consistent outlines over time. Uh, the Southeast Brooklyn, where we are now, predominantly African-American, Afro-Caribbean, um, Central Brooklyn as well, Manhattan, upper Manhattan, Non-white, lower Manhattan tends to be uh, predominantly white, except for Chinatown, Lower East Side, and on and on. But you'll see as we go through how some of the voting results for candidates sometimes follow those patterns, sometimes don't. They sometimes follow enrollment patterns, sometimes they don't. And when they don't follow those patterns, that's when it gets interesting because it's a, a consideration or a sense of how people are uh, kind of breaking out from the mold. So first, we're in a presidential election year now, so let's look at the last two presidential elections. In 2008, when uh, candidate Obama ran, it was historic. Uh, he won New York City big, <clears throat> virtually everywhere, except for Staten Island, a couple of spots in more conservative areas in southern Brooklyn, and a couple of spots here and there. Generally, he did very well overall. I want you to pay attention also to <clears throat> the turnout percentage that we have on each of these maps, and this follows on what the last speaker just 
talk about how uh, the, the turnout in some races is maybe okay, 50%, probably could be better, but you'll see how that changes when you look at the local election as well. In 2012, Obama also did very well, not as well in some areas, you can see by the lighter blue. The dark blue is where he did very well, and the orange and dark red is where he didn't do well. But then, let's compare this to the local elections, um, and how they've been, how the voting patterns were when Bloomberg ran through his dynasty. Um, and then how that changed when de Blasio ran in 2013, and also how these patterns are different from how we vote, uh, we tend to vote as a city for, for president or for governor. So <clears throat> this is Bloomberg's first election when he won against Mark Green. <clears throat> and you can see that he, unlike Obama, he did, Bloomberg did very well in a bigger swath of South Brooklyn, most of Queens, except for Southeast Queens and uh, part of the Rockaways. Um, he did well in Park Slope and Brooklyn Heights, where the, the light blue is in, in Brooklyn, predominantly liberal white areas, up through Manhattan, and then into Upper Manhattan and the Bronx, uh, where, where Mark Green did well. So this, these three maps that I'll be showing you, again, tend to follow more or less the enrollment patterns, and also predominant race and ethnicity characteristics. This one's a little different from Fernando Ferrer, ran against Bloomberg. He didn't do well in Southeast Brooklyn, although he did well in some of the other areas that you can see. Uh, Green did well, and also the next map showing how Bill Thompson did when he ran against Bloomberg. <clears throat> the Thompson map is interesting because Thompson hoped to really carry through on the historic vote the year before, 2008, when Obama ran. Obama endorsed him, although it was kind of a lukewarm endorsement, and he really put, Thompson really hoped to capitalize on that, and he didn't do well enough. Um, he was close, closer than people expected when he ran against Bloomberg, <clears throat> but um, it wasn't enough to carry it through. Just to go back quick through these slides, so you can see when Green ran in 2001 for mayor, the turnout was 40% of the voters. Four years later, it dropped down to 35%, then down to 25%, and then when de Blasio ran in 2013, 24%. It's been going down consistently, which is a, a bad thing, and I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but there are a lot of reasons for that. When de Blasio ran, he kind of broke the mold over the past three mayoral elections. He did very well in Southeast Queens, in Central Brooklyn, Harlem, most of the Bronx. He also kind of put together a coalition of liberal white population, predominantly black and Hispanic population, uh, in terms of the voter turnout, and, uh, and won. <clears throat> and that was um, not necessarily expected, and it really I think, changed the dynamic, uh, and, and part of it was he didn't have a great opponent. Joe Loda was, you know, people were kind of lukewarm about him, even Republicans. Uh, but also, de Blasio had a very powerful message to tell two cities, and that really resonated, and that carried him through to winning. <clears throat> the primary elections, in some ways, matter more than the general elections. Um, since we are such a democratic town, and uh, the enrollment is so heavily democratic, that uh, if you're not registered Democrat, you can't vote in Democratic primaries, but that's in some ways what really decides who the, the winners are going to be in the, the general election. The patterns, I'll go through these kind of quick, um, are much more mixed in terms of the voting uh, results because there tend to be more candidates and there's a lot of inter, you know, within party politics going on. Um, this is how de Blasio did in 2013 against eight other candidates. As probably remember from the campaign a few years ago. This is how Bill Thompson did. Another thing to look at, especially with primary elections, is uh, not to be crass about it, but sometimes there's more transactional voting going on. You know, the candidate says something that one particular community really likes, and they vote for him in, in places that might be unexpected. So uh, this area of the Upper East Side right here, the dark green indicates that 
in the primary, Thompson did very well in, those, in that particular community. And most people believe that's because he came out against a waste transfer station, a garbage uh, dump, in effect, that would have been a built in their community, I think it's being built now. And so they really, you know, supported him for that. Um, uh, and people weren't expecting him to be well in that area, otherwise. This is uh, the vote pattern for Zephyr T. Chapman. She ran against Cuomo. Okay, I'll go through these kind of quick. And you can see again that Cuomo did very well in all the areas that are red. And T. Chapman did well, but only in a couple of areas. Um, this is how Clinton, Hillary Clinton did in 2008 in the primary for president. And almost the mirror opposite of that, how she did against Bernie Sanders this time around. <coughs> And this is the map of who voted for Donald Trump. One interesting thing about this map is that, especially in the heavily Democratic areas, again, you can't vote in the Republican primary, vice versa, if you're rich Democrat or not rich party, you can't vote in the Democratic primary. So there were a lot of blank areas on the map. People just couldn't vote. Um, and they or even if they were registered Republican, they could just stay home because they didn't like any of the candidates. So just to go through real quick, who can vote? So there are a number of thresholds to consider. Number one, you have to be a citizen and 18 or older. Number two, you have to actually register. You can't, if you're not registered, if you don't fill out the form, you can't vote, even if you're eligible. Then if you want to vote in the primary, you have to be enrolled in a party. And a lot of times what happens is people don't register in a party. You have that option. That means you might maintain your independence, but you can't vote. You, you won't have a say in the primary elections. And then you actually need to go out and vote. And we know that that's sometimes not always easy, even in New York City. <clears throat> so here's a map of, from a website that we developed uh, that shows some of these differences. So this is the Senator's District, District 10. Um, the color patterns indicate predominant uh, race and ethnicity characteristics. The red and orange is predominantly African American, Afro Caribbean. Uh, green is predominantly Hispanic. Purple is predominantly Asian. And blue is predominantly white population. Um, and you can see, you can make out these numbers. So each Senate and Assembly district is pretty much the same number of overall population. In this case, when the district lines got drawn, 320,000 people. But only 174,000 people are eligible to vote in this district, so about half. A lot of that is kids, whether they're citizens or not, but a big chunk, like 20% uh, or so, are people who are not citizens. So that's a factor, uh, and the elected officials think about that. Who can vote, who's eligible to vote, and then of course, who's registered to vote. And then just one last slide, got a few more, but I'll just leave it with this one. To give you a sense of what participation is and how it drops off, this is a chart that shows people who registered right before the presidential election, before the 2000, 2004, 2008, and 2012 presidential elections. So the blue line is who registered right before the election. The red bar is who voted. And you can see how it drops off. In 2008, when Obama first ran, it probably dropped off the least, but it still dropped off. So people who just registered to vote didn't turn out to vote. And then the green bar is of those people who then voted in the municipal election, the mayoral election, the city council elections in the year following. And you can see how it further it drops. So I don't have answers necessarily about how to fix that. Hopefully working together with your votes and others, uh, that can change. But that's the you know, harsh reality. Sorry to leave on a down note, but that's, uh, that's the information. So hopefully that will inspire us all to do better and, and to participate even more. All right, thanks very much. Happy to chat.